Well, good morning. We're continuing our series in the book of Philippians. And when we last left off, we are, we've been looking at chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. We're calling this section, Paul's Report for Me to Live is Christ, a Unified Life. And what we get here in this passage of Scripture is a glimpse into what does a person's life look like when their focus is Jesus. And so we've been saying that those who have Jesus as their highest priority, and we've been filling in the blank, things that are true of a person like that. First of all, those who have Jesus as their highest priority, just to review where we've been, trust God's sovereign appointments to suffering and seek to use them to advance the gospel. And we see Paul doing that with his imprisonment. Secondly, have good motives in proclaiming Christ. We see this in Paul, contrasted with some teachers who did not have good motives. Now, that leads us to number three. Those who have Jesus as their highest priority rejoice that the master and the message are true, even if the messengers sometimes are not. Because Paul was dealing with that with some other teachers who their motives weren't good, but he was still rejoicing that at least the message was true, and certainly our, our master is true. Fourthly, those who have Jesus as their highest priority rejoice that the plan of God for Christ to be boldly magnified, made much of in our bodies, whether by life or by death, will be accomplished through the prayers of the saints and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Fifthly, we said, and this kind of comes, this is part of the, that ties the whole thing together when he says, for me to live is Christ, in verse 21, we said, those who have Jesus as their highest priority know that life is all about Jesus, to know him, enjoy him, and make him known. Well, now we come to the next part of this passage, and let me just, we'll read this section together, and we'll dive right in. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 to 26. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. For if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know what I will choose. But I am hard-pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. I am convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your reason for boasting may abound in Christ Jesus in me through my coming to you again. Well, we come to a big one today, and it's this. Those who have Jesus as their highest priority know that death is gain. They know that death is gain. Now, as I prepare to share this with you on um, this particular day, on Sunday afternoon, Lord willing, we'll be going to the funeral of a, a dear family friend of ours and also attending a, a kind of a celebration of life because we're coming up on the, it's been a little over a year since one of our friends uh, went to be with the Lord. And it struck me as I was going over this again, uh, uh, you know, last minute preparations before doing the video, looking back over the notes and making more notes and from the study throughout the week and, um, When we have Jesus as our highest priority, death is gain. That's a big statement. So let's unpack that. And what is Paul saying? What is he not saying? What does he mean? What does he not mean? Well, there's a very interesting thing going on here. He, in Greek, he's using an alliteration. He's using assonance. Okay, And I, I wish I could put this on a screen for you. When he says to live is Christ and to die is gain... In Greek, and excuse me if I don't pronounce this correctly, it's tuzin Christos, to live as Christ, tu apothenein kurdos, to die as gain. So Christos, kurdos, Christ, gain. There's this, this neat literary thing that's going on in the original here. Um, what Paul does not mean, first of all, he is in no way suicidal. Let's make that clear, because at first when you read this, if you're not familiar with the context of what's going on, he says, I am hard, I, I do not know what I will choose. I'm hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. It, he's not suicidal. We know that from the context. We know that from Paul's theology. He knows that suffering is used to make us more 
like Christ. It's part of life in the fallen world. He talks about this in Romans 8, 28 uh, to 30. James, in the book of James in the New Testament, certainly addresses the fact that Christians suffer, and God uses that suffering in the fallen world to help us live out our citizenship of, of who we are, who we belong to. We belong to the Lord. We become more and more like Christ. Um, even here in Philippians, we've already talked about how that Paul earlier in the passage has talked about he rejoices at the plan of God for Christ to be boldly magnified in our bodies whether by life or by death will be accomplished through the prayers of the saints and the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ and before that we talked about he trusts that God's sovereign appointment to suffer uh, appoints God's sovereign appointments to suffering and he's seeking to use them to advance the gospel so Paul's not wanting to somehow get out of suffering by committing suicide that's not what he's talking about in this fallen world, suffering is part of our lives, and it's a tool that God in his goodness takes and uses for our good. What the enemy means for evil, God takes and he uses it for our good. So he's not suicidal. What, what does he mean? When he says, I do not know what I will choose, uh, he possibly has two meanings. One is he's simply saying, I don't know what I'm going to make my desire. Like, if it was up to me, what would I choose is kind of what he means. Would I choose to stay here or would I choose to go home? The second option would be that perhaps God let him know that he had a choice supernaturally. Hey, Paul, do you want to come home with, you know, be with me? Or do you want to stay down here a little while longer? It's, what do you want to choose? Maybe God had given him a choice. Um, personally, I lean toward more of the first option. I think he's just kind of pondering, like, you know, if I could choose, I don't know which one I would. Hmm, what would I choose? Would I choose to stay here? Or would I choose to go home? Um... And he knows that to be with Christ is much better. He says, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is much better. And there's this tension here of what's he going to do? Well, why would we say that death is gain? Why would we say that being with Christ in eternity is much better than here? Well, let's break this down and let's discuss some things. First of all, Paul makes it very clear that um, he does not believe in what's called soul sleep. Soul sleep is a doctrine that is sometimes taught in Christian circles that when a person dies, they're just kind of dormant until the future resurrection. And so they're just kind of, their soul is kind of asleep. They're just dormant until the future resurrection, and then they're back at it when their body is raised. That is not what Paul believed. That's not what the Bible teaches. Um, for Paul, though he believes in a future bodily resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 58, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Though he believes in a future bodily resurrection, he also believes that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I want to read you from 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 11. This is why he can say death is gain, because if he dies, he's going to be with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 11. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Again, we believe in the doctrine of eternal security. The Holy Spirit is your guarantee, your pledge of what is to come. You are, you are his, that's secure. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And even in this passage, Paul is saying that's what he prefers. Verse 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now this is not for salvation. This is for rewards. We've talked about this before from, or, um, from 1 Corinthians where a believer's works are tried to see whether gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. But the believer is, is saved. So then, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But what we have 
what we have been made manifest to God. Excuse me, but we have been made manifest to God. And I hope that we have been made manifest also in your consciences. So Paul does not believe in soul sleep. He knows that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In fact, uh, the Bible makes this clear in the story in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 8. Let me read it to you. This is a story of the transfiguration of Jesus. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain alone by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments were shining intensely white as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with him. Notice, Elijah and Moses appear to him. In other words, their soul isn't asleep. They're very much alive and active. They're awake, if you will. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And all at once, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. So what we see here are Elijah and Moses, who died years ago, but they're very much alive in the presence of um, here with Jesus. That They're very much alive. So the Bible does not teach soul sleep, but it does teach a future bodily resurrection. You see, Right now, when we die, your spirit goes to be with the Lord. But there is to be a future bodily resurrection. Jesus addresses this. Um, he, he was talking to some Sadducees who did not believe in a bodily resurrection. And uh, he says this, But regarding the fact, this is Mark chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, But regarding the fact that the dead are raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. And the Bible speaks of that future resurrection and our resurrection bodies that we will receive in the future. 1 Corinthians 15, 50-55. Now I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the corruptible inherit incorruptible. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on the incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible puts on the incorruptible, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the word that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So we want to be careful in defining these things, what the Bible says and what it doesn't say. Um, the Bible teaches a future bodily resurrection, but the Bible also teaches that even now, when we die, our spirits go to be with the Lord. So if Paul can say that to die is gain because he's gained Christ. He's gained Christ by faith. Back in the book of Philippians, see, not everyone can say that death is gain. For an unbeliever, death is not gain. Um, death is very much not gain. It's going the other direction. It's loss. But Paul had Christ. Philippians 3, verses 8 and 9. More than that, I count all these things to be lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I, it's a very powerful word in, word in the Greek, but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, watch this, not having a righteousness of my own, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God upon faith. This is how a person is saved, by faith, by believing that Jesus is God who came and lived the perfect life that we never could and died in our place, taking our sin, taking the punishment that we deserved so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have his righteousness credited to our account and eternal life that goes with it. Paul believed that. 1 John 5.12 says, He who has the Son has the life. 
He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. But see, when you have Jesus, you have the life. And so dying is gain. I want to quote to you Bill Lane, uh, the mentor of my mentor, Michael Card, in, in his book, Understand the New Testament, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians, he writes this. The line between physical life and death loses significance when you live in Christ. Let me read that again. The line between physical life and death loses significance when you live in Christ. In other words, as a Christian, you're not scared of death. Your life just goes on with the Lord. You see, when Christ is our greatest desire, being with him is better. And that's why death is no threat. Let me give you some reasons why death is gain. First of all, we will finally be with our Savior you want to just use one word to describe it, you can say presence. We'll finally be with our Savior. Now, you may remember we've talked several times here lately, it seems, about the Holy Spirit who lives in us, who sent the moment of salvation to indwell us. And Jesus said in John 16, 7, it was actually to his advantage, to our advantage, excuse me, that he ascended the Father so that the Spirit would come. We said, this is incredible. Jesus was saying that you and I have it better today with the Holy Spirit living inside of us than the disciples did pre, pre-resurrection when they were with him physically but didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. And it's not hard to figure this out as to why when you read through the Gospels and you see the times that Jesus would say something and they just did not understand what he was talking about. But then after the resurrection, after the Spirit is in them, they understand. So you may go, well, if we have it so good with the Holy Spirit living in us, then why is it such a big deal to be physically present with Jesus? It's a big deal because now we're physically present with him, and we have the Holy Spirit in us. John 14, 6, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate that he may be with you forever. So if you're a believer and you die, when you go to be in the presence of the Lord, you have God without you because there is Jesus, and you have God within you, the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Father is there as well. So death is gain because we'll finally be with Christ our Savior with the Holy Spirit living in us and we're finally going to be able to see his glory. That's part of being in his presence. John 17, 24, Jesus praying says this, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. When a believer passes from this life to the next, we will be physically present with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in us, and we'll be able to behold Jesus in his glory. Hallelujah. Well, the second reason the death would be gained, the first will finally be with our Savior, presence. The second is we will finally be free from sin. You want to use one, use one word to describe this, use the word purity. 1 John 3, 2-3, to three, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been manifested as yet what we will be. But we know that when he is manifested, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope on him purifies himself, just as he is pure. There's something about seeing Jesus in his glory that makes us be like him. And there's a principle of that even now, because when we know that's our future, we're to seek to enact that in the present. That's why he says, he who has his hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. And one of the ways we see him even now is being in the scriptures. And when we see him for who he is and understand his love for us, if we believe it, it makes us love him, and out of our love, we obey him. So being with Jesus is gain. We're, we're with him. We're seeing him in his glory. We have the Holy Spirit in us, and we'll finally be free from our sin. Um, I hope that you're walking the victorious Christian life, but we all sin. We all have those areas where we have to keep a very close watch on. What a wonderful thing it will be when we're at home with the Lord and we see him for who he is. And it's like 
just can't sin anymore. Just can't do it. <laughs> you won't be like him. Well, the next thing is this. We will finally be free from suffering. We'll finally be free from suffering. You said the first one, if you want to use one word, we'll finally be with the Savior, that's presence. Um, we will finally be free from sin, that's purity. Here, we'll finally be free from suffering, that's protection. You see, in this fallen world, we do suffer. And God, who's good, sovereignly uses that suffering, what the enemy means for evil, uh, uses it will take that and use it for good to conform us to be like Jesus. But in heaven, we'll be like Jesus, because we're going to see him as he is, see him in his glory, and we don't have to suffer. We don't have to suffer. Now, let me clarify what I mean when I say we don't have to suffer. What I mean is no one can harm you in heaven. No one's going to torture you for being a Christian in heaven. They can't mock you for being uh, a believer in, in heaven. Um, I mean, that would be, uh, you're with the Lord, okay? Um, you're protected. You can't be martyred in heaven. You're, you're safely home. But I want to be careful here for us to realize there's a progression in how the story unfolds, Okay? Remember, again, that if you depart right now, if you pass into the next life and you're with the Lord, your spirit goes to be with him, but you're still awaiting that resurrected body. All right, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which, we, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by his working through which he is able to, to even subject all things to himself. So remember, we believe the coming of the Lord is imminent. right? It can happen any time, any moment. And Paul, writing, knows that it can happen any time. All right? And so uh, uh, one of my, I remember Michael Carden saying that for Paul, the coming of the Lord is so imminent that it's when you read the writings of Paul, it's almost like he's rushing to get to the end of the sentence before the Lord comes back. Okay, so in Philippians, Paul says, look, we're looking for the Lord to return, and that's when our, our bodies going to be transformed to be like his. Like if we're alive, when the rapture of the church happens, and the dead in Christ are raised, then our bodies will also going to be transformed at that moment. Okay, so if we die, our spirit goes to be with the Lord, but we're still awaiting that future physical resurrection. Let me read you something. I wrote this down. I want to read you the precise wording here. When we say that there will be no suffering when we are in heaven, we must make it clear that while there will be no physical suffering and much less emotional suffering, verses like Revelation 6, 9 to 11, 7, 16 to 17, and 21, 4 seem to imply that until the eternal state arrives, there will be sorrow in heaven over the sin that is happening on earth even though tears are wiped away for those in heaven, Revelation 7, 16 to 17, and will be completely wiped away in the eternal state when the new heaven and new earth arrive, Revelation 21, 4. Remember, we're part of an unfolding story. So when our spirit passes to be with the Lord, yes, we're protected, absolutely. But as far as this sorrow goes, let me just, let me just read you this, this passage here. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. And this would, we believe, if you believe that the church is raptured before the tribulation, then this is happening after the church has been in heaven. But meanwhile, things are going on on earth, okay? And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the witness which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, How long, O Master, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them, and it was told to them that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow slaves and their brothers who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So it seems that these folks in heaven are concerned about what has happened on earth. They remember what happened when they were on earth. And they're concerned about where is, Lord, when is the justice going to come, basically? And the Lord responds, it's coming, wait. To summarize, it's coming, wait. This unfolding story. Let's fast forward to Revelation 7, 13 to 17. 
Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These clothed in the white robes, who are they? And from where have they come? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, in other words, they believed in Jesus for salvation. For this reason, because they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, they had faith in Christ, they are before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his sanctuary, and he who sits on the throne will dwell over them. They will, no long, they will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them and will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So you put these verses together, and we see that the people that in this time in history, and it seems that it, it holds to reason, that the same would hold true for us today in our time period, that when a person passes into eternity with the Lord, and they're in heaven with the Lord, they still remember what happened to them down here on earth. And they may have questions about, Lord, where is the justice? How long? And God responds here specifically in this situation, wait, the story's not done yet, but it's coming. And then we see him in chapter 7, wiping away the tears from the eyes of those who have been killed during this time. Finally, in Revelation 21, 1 to 5, when the eternal state comes, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. So I hope you see the beauty of this story that is unfolding. But even now, even though the story is not done, we know from what the Bible teaches us that for the believer, to depart and be with Christ is, is far better. So Paul is not suicidal at all. Um, he's willing to go through suffering. He's proved that he's willing to go through suffering. He's just saying that he knows that it's going to be better to be with the Lord. We can't possibly imagine what all it's going to be like. And just to review, we'll finally be with our Savior, with the Holy Spirit living in us, so we're able to understand what he's saying. Um, we're going to be able to see his glory. We're finally going to be free from our sin, and we're going to be free from suffering. And when we do have concerns about what has happened on this earth and, Lord, how long, uh, the Father, we see in Scripture him saying, it's coming, it's coming. And we see him wiping away tears. So we know that to be with the Lord is far better. I want you to notice the total lack of fear on Paul's part. He's not afraid of death. Both in Philippians and in Colossians, he talks about this. I remember my, my friend, Denny Denson, who was a, a, a mentor to Mike and mentor to me in Franklin. He had faced death on a trip overseas. And he came back, and um, we still had him a while. And then eventually he, he did pass. But one of the things I remember Denny saying is this, that basically for a believer to be afraid of death is an insult to God. We don't fear death. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15 says this, Therefore, since the children shared in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he, as Jesus, might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. When you know Jesus, you don't have to be afraid of death. Again, to use the Bill Lane quote, I'll read it again. The line between physical life and death loses significance when you live in Christ. You're not afraid. Wouldn't you don't have to be afraid to die? 
that's when you're truly free to live. When you don't have to be afraid to die, that's when you're free to truly live. And listen, live. Live. Paul looks at his situation and he knows that it's to his gain to be at home with the Lord. He knows it'll be way better than being in jail. He's going to be with his Savior, free of sin, free of... So he knows it's better. But he comes to the conclusion, and Lord willing, we'll deal with this next week, that he realizes that there's still work for him to do. And while it may be more beneficial for him personally to go on and be in heaven... It's going to be more beneficial for people around him if he stays put and serves the Lord here and now. And we'll, Lord willing, we'll dive into that next week. Let me say this as our takeaway from this week. Don't fear death, but choose life. Choose life. Seek to live as long as the Lord chooses to give you. See death as gain, but choose life. Paul did. And make sure that for you to live is Christ. And when that time comes, and it is your time to go, that you can see the Lord. What a contrast. I think of believers that they're saved, but they're not walking the way they should in fellowship with the Lord. And then I think about those who know the Lord, and they're passionately walking with the Lord, seeking to live moment by moment, surrender to the Lord Think about the difference in their deaths. I don't want to be in a situation where when I see the Lord, I'm like, well, sorry about that thing that we were working on and I quite, hadn't quite surrendered to you. Just, you know, uh, yeah, sorry about, no. I mean, obviously it'd all be forgiven at that point, but we want to be walking in faith, in fellowship with the Lord now so that when we do see him, we know it's just this unbroken fellowship, right? And now forever it's unbroken because now we are without sin in the presence of our Savior. For the believer, death is gain. So don't be afraid of death. When you're not afraid of death, you're free to truly live. So live. And let us say that for, for us to live is Christ. We love you.